to round off the evening today here, I'd, I'd like to just welcome all our speakers again. So Mario Popio is the uh, le leader of Boston Global Zero. It's a great pleasure to have you here. We don't, you've already, you already met Bill Pitt, or a bunch of our speakers here. Who have you not met yet? So, so Charles Ferguson is the president of the Federation for American Scientists, uh, an organization which, um, which does, in my opinion, a lot of very nerdy stuff, which is incredibly important. We hear everybody talking about how many nuclear weapons there are that all the different countries have and how many different kinds there are. Where do you think that information comes from? Do you think it's something that's published in, the, in Pravda on the front page and officially put up by the military? No. They do a lot of hard research. People like Hans Christensen and so on, painstaking work on all this geeky stuff. And it's so valuable to have a, a debate which is actually focused on <laughs> facts rather, rather than a, a, a speculation. Gary Goldstein comes down from Tufts University. Whew, another one of my physics colleagues. So this is the physics mafia corner here. <laughs> Frank Wilczek he, he has also dabbled a little bit of physics in physics. He dabbled a little bit in quarks and stuff. And my, 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 my Swedish countryman and gave him a free trip to Stockholm for that once upon a time to see if he could get him addicted to, to pickled herring. And um, I think it worked. He's been back to Sweden lots of times since then as well. So any progress on the, on the chair? Yes, okay. Oh, good. So um, you guys can sit down and relax for a little bit first, because first I'm going to torment the panel list with a bunch of questions. But then there'll be plenty of chances for you also. So since this is the end of a, of a long day, I would like to start by looking a little bit towards the future. We've been handed a lot of challenges. We've been told that there's a grave, there are great problems here. We need to solve them. We would like to end the day with a feeling not only that there are things that we can do, but more specific things that would be really, really useful. So I'd like to go around once first relatively quickly and have each, each person pick out the one single thing which they think is the most useful thing that we can do. And you can take the, you can you choose to interpret the word we either as the majestic plural as something you, one can do in, at the individual level or <laughs> in a more broad sense, if you want. So Gary, do you want to start off? Okay. <clears throat> uh, something that I'm especially concerned about is educating young people. Uh, having been a physicist and a teacher of physics for decades, uh, I know that many of the issues we have heard about today are unknown to many of our young people. And one place that people learn about the physics of nuclear weapons, you would think would be in physics classes. But they don't, by and large. And so uh, I will talk about, when I have time, uh, an effort we are making to spread the word that nuclear weapons are a natural subject to address in freshman physics, advanced physics, graduate physics. They affect us all. We should all be worried about them. And we should have some knowledge about what they are about and, and how to deal with them. Great. Over to you, Frank. Well, it's been a very inspiring experience today to learn so much and hear so much about what's possible. Uh, I think, broadly speaking, the most important thing we can do is raise consciousness. Uh, I think the most important thing we can do is raise consciousness. And this has several components. Uh, raise consciousness of the horrific nature of nuclear war. Uh, raise consciousness of the costs of enabling our outside capacity. And raise consciousness that there are steps we can take to uh, alleviate the situation, to alleviate the danger. And I think we heard a lot about all those things today. And there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of thinking to be done about how best to implement uh, this process of raising consciousness and, take, and taking concrete steps. But I think the first step is to raise our own consciousness and then go out into the world. 
So uh, Max uh, mentioned a little bit about Federation of American Scientists. I, I feel very privileged and, and humbled to uh, lead the organization. It's now in its 70 years, uh, founded soon after the end of World War II, founded by many of the atomic scientists who uh, built the first atomic bombs, the Manhattan Project. So my message is we need to reverse the Manhattan Project. And to do that, we can do you know, two activities I'll briefly mention, maybe get into more depth a little later. Number one, speaking to, I know there's a younger scientist who was up there earlier, asked a, a question of Dr. Perry and some other younger people. So we're trying to involve younger people, younger scientists, younger engineers, and political scientists, policy experts, working with faculty members in task forces and study groups, networked technical and policy people working on these tough, you know, seemingly impossible problems. But Joe Trinity only is absolutely right. The impossible happens all the time. We just need talented younger people working with more senior people in these types of projects. And another thing I'll just telegraph is Monday of this past week, we issued a letter endorsed by 35 Nobel laureates in the sciences, a couple of them here at MIT, calling on the national leaders at the Nuclear Security Summit, calling out three technical areas where if we make further progress, we could drive the risk of nuclear terrorism essentially to zero in those sectors. And I can get into that more depth later if we have time, but um, I will turn now to Susie. Wow, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Pause. Um, I think it's, we've heard so many things, and I think for me, one of the greatest things to take away today is to remember that we have power, we have agency, we can do something. How you choose to do something, whether it's as a citizen, as a, a voter, um, as somebody with a bank account, um, whatever you choose to do, you must do it, whether it's as a professor. You have power to influence this issue. And I think, for me, that's the most important thing to take away, because this, this is terrifying. But we don't, we're not powerless in the face of it. So that's where I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. My, my message is the same as I gave my talk, which is get educated. You can use, <clears throat> for example, Plowshare's website, our website, American Scientist website, Max's website, get lots of current information about what's going on, what can be done about it. So get educated, and then use that education to educate others, your friends, your neighbors, um, your classmates. For example, you go to our website, take that video which you just saw here, download it, and then call in 10 of your neighbors, play them the video, and say, what do you think of that? What do you think we should do about it? Get a little discussion going on. So you yourself can be part of the education process. That's great. I agree with everything that's been said so far. Let me add one thing we haven't maybe talked enough about. I'm old enough to remember that when you, that you had to go outside and flag down a taxi if you actually wanted to go someplace in the city. But there was an app that changed the way people move in this country. I think there's tremendous potential for apps in this field. And this little divestment app that you came up building off of this, that's a little miracle as far as I'm concerned. I didn't think that was possible. What Alex Wallerstein's done with NukeMap, I, I think there's a huge potential for the proliferation of apps in this field. And uh, just before you start uh, talking, Mary, we've had a number of people throughout the day saying it's so important to try to engage idealistic and talented young people. How can we get these uh, young people engaged? Well, <laughs> you are one of these idealistic and talented young people, so I think there's nobody better to answer this than you. Yeah, so I know um, I'm actually, I have something to say to all the young people in the audience. Um, we. Um, are all here because we care about this issue um, and we need to take ownership of this issue. I think I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Joseph Gerson um, and other veteran activists who have mentored me and um, who I could go to. Um, and I actually just came from the Nuclear Security Summit um, where me and my fellow Action Corps leaders at Global Zero, all young people, were together and I cannot tell you how this combination of mentorship um, from 
uh, other generations and fellowship with young people like us, we, we can build a movement. There is so much hope um, that, that I feel from, from this, um, this cross section. And people say, or people tell me a lot, oh, well, you know, I don't know much about nuclear weapons other than like Fallout 4 or um, maybe Dr. Strangelove. But I, I think that's a misconception about young people. I think we are passionate, we are hopeful, um, and I really believe that we can be the generation to, to realize a world without nuclear weapons. And so I would love to talk to all of you young people out there afterwards and to all um, other people who don't identify as young people. <laughs> I strongly encourage you, I strongly encourage you to mentor because that has been the most amazing experience for me to be in the Boston community and have all these amazing mentors to draw from. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for all, all seven of you for these inspiring suggestions. It's very clear that uh, not only should we do something, but there are a lot of great things to do. Um, focusing a little bit more specifically on one of them, one of the ways in which we can have influence through, through voting, through politics, I wanted to come back a little bit to um, an issue that, that you, Joe, brought up there. <clears throat> Traditionally, foreign policy has stopped at water's edge. And more recently, there's been this sort of unfortunate politicization, a little bit, maybe Republican versus Democrat, of an issue which ought to have nothing to do with whether, you, whether you're fiscally conservative or not, whether you're, whether you're left or whether you're right. And, and even right now, I think it's important to remember that it still is not a left-right issue. And if you look more, a little bit more nuanced and closely at it, you have people for also like on the libertarian side or anything but Democrat, you have people like Rand Paul, Ron Paul, et cetera, who very much want to wanted down, spend less money on, on nuclear weapons. So the, the question I would like to throw out to all of you is there, there is a great opportunity this year to try to get this more discussed in, in upcoming presidential debates, et cetera. I would love to hear if anyone has any thoughts for what we can do. And now I actually don't mean we as in the people of the US, we in this room, to try to inject this as one of the legitimate uh, debate topics in the debates and, and try to get, the, get the candidates, even in the primaries, to actually commit to things. Anyone want to bite this uh, bullet? Yeah? Mary? <laughs> um, so I know something that Global Zero, the American Friends Service Committee and Mass Peace Action has worked really hard on in New Hampshire and Iowa um, was bird dogging. And it's really, really fun. Um, essentially, if you haven't heard of bird dogging, you basically follow candidates around the campaign trail and ask them questions about the issue you care about, in our case, nuclear weapons. And our three um, groups have been successful at getting candidates on record saying that they would support support some of the things that we support. Um, so that's, I think, one really fun and also very great idea. So we can do this at multiple levels. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, honored to be asked by Senator Sanders to be an advisor to his campaign. So I'll see what I can do on that end. <laughs> Well, I hate to sound so pessimistic, but I think this primary season, these debates have been so dysfunctional and so ludicrous that I would just assume the subject did not come up during the debates. <laughs> I don't live in this country, so when I watch and see how things are talked about um, in media outside of here, it's, uh, it's really interesting. One of the things that I've seen come up a lot is that some of the bold, bold statements that really expose the illegitimacy of nuclear weapons, um, that gets transmitted in my media at home. So when, when you do see something and a lot of things that have come out from Trump that just make it sound so insane, it actually really helps our national discussions about the legitimacy of nuclear weapons because it looks like this is a dumb weapon. Uh-oh, we better figure out how to not be involved with it. Um. Yeah. yeah, good, you're right, <laughs> right on, right, yeah. Well, I, I'd have to agree with Dr. Perry, but since I have the microphone, I'll briefly say, <laughs> I, I want to praise uh, uh, you know, Professor Ernie Moniz and the work he's done working in the Obama administration as Secretary of Energy, especially on the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, just the connections he had through th this oh, great school. And uh, you know he deserves you know a medals for the work not just he has done but 
others that support him, especially a lot of technical people, scientists and engineers that help this nuclear deal uh, take place. You know, still a lot, lot to be done with the deal, but I think uh, Ernie Moniz deserves a lot of credit. Just, uh, just to insert a little bit of, of uh, MIT color here, it was also, some of you may not know that the lead technical negotiator on the Ar Iranian side also went to MIT right. and studied nuclear engineering. So, he, so, so that they had this strange bonding over their, over their the whole MIT connection, and they had, they had a lot of things in common which sort of transcended the national differences there. I think. And, and the baby clothes too. I think the Iranian uh, uh, had his, his, like, his daughter and had a child, and then Ernie came back here. Well, I think there are two different levels. Uh, one is the actual debates, which I think are very significant events that uh, have command the national audience and, and get a lot of attention. And I think it would be an excellent project for the Future of Life Institute to sculpt a particular question that we could get behind and, and publicize to journalists so that one of the people on the debate committee would actually pose this question. And if we can get the right question posed, I think it could be very significant. Uh, so this is, the, a, this is just to follow up on that. This is a little bit like in uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where you have the answer. Well, what is the question? So, what is the question, <laughs> what is the that, question? that you would recommend on the panel that should be asked if there is one that could be somehow inserted into the debate? Well, I think somehow it would have to be artfully crafted, but somehow the, uh, the to get the idea that the, uh, the direction of nuclear motion should be towards reduction. If we can make that an issue that's clarified and if maybe distinguish the candidates, I think that would be a very important thing because I, I think the general public is very much or could easily become very much uh, of the opinion that reduction is the right way to go. On the other hand, the donor class, the Republican Party as it exists, not so much. So. That could be an important distinction. Uh, in the longer run, I know the American Physical Society has s submitted uh, detailed uh, questions, series of questions to candidates who have responded. Uh, in that case, uh, the audience is, is different. It's not, uh, and I think also the people answering the questions are different. It's not not the candidates themselves, but their staffs, and they're carefully thought out. Uh, and those, I think, could be important in the longer term for getting on the record commitments to specific meaningful issues. So I think that two-tiered approach, uh, one crisp, dramatic question for the debates themselves, and then a series of questions well thought out that would get long-term commitments from the candidates. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I think to some extent the Republican candidates and what they have said directly or indirectly about nuclear weapons is forcing the Democrats to say something about reducing the dangers of nuclear war. Uh, both Trump and Cruz uh, have attitudes about nuclear weapons that are so frightening even Obama had something to say about it yesterday. Uh, and, and so I think what will happen is that when the debates occur between the Republican and the Democrat, whichever it is, uh, the Democrat is going to have to use that issue as an important one. And to the extent that we can feed the questions or the answers to the Democratic candidate, uh, we will be okay, but I don't know how to do that, really. Lots of great ideas there. Another recurrent theme I've heard throughout the day here that it seems everybody agrees on is that we want to stigmatize nu nuclear weapons production. We want people to understand that 
it's a bad thing, not a good thing. And it's very it's empowering to think about how things can gradually become stigmatized even when they were once considered very cool. Like, raise your hand if you're over 60, for example. Do you remember how cool smoking used to be when you were kids? When the news anchors used to smoke and all the hottest actors and actresses would smoke on television and so on, you know? But right now, it's, we haven't outlawed smoking, but it isn't considered cool anymore. If I see someone smoking here on campus, I pretty much take for granted that they're not a student. And, uh, it's, and, I, and I also assume that they're probably trying to quit, actually, because and smoking as a result is, very way, is way, way down. So I would love to hear, go around once here and see if you want to put out one idea for, for, for your favorite idea for stigmatizing nuclear weapons and making them, rather than having people think of them as a school thing that we absolutely have to have to blow up asteroids or, or feel safe or, or you name it, as something which is really, <laughs> has a yuck factor, something which is really just a problem we want to try to get rid of gradually. So, uh, do you want to start over on your end again, Mary? Okay. Okay. Um, so, I think this is something that Global Zero does really well, um, like the cool factor, right? Um, so, Global Zero, I think, first of all, social media is a really awesome tool for doing this. Um, and I know that Global Zero has like bumper stickers, like there's one that says just don't do it with the Nike sign, or it's like there's a card against humanity card that says like nukes against humanity, or I don't know, just um, pop culture and social media, I think are huge tools to disseminate this message. Um, and I also think at least from a, uh, the perspective of, of a 20-something, if I see a bunch of my friends out at a rally against nuclear weapons, I'm going to think it's probably something cool that I should do, um, or at least want to know more about. So I think just just um, if, if a lot of people are, are doing it, I think there's power in numbers. Mm. At, uh, we've looked at this at Plowshares Fund. In fact, for those interested, if you Google Plowshares Cultural Strategy, you come up with this wonderful report that we had done uh, just about two years ago now that looked at how these social transformations happen. How, how do the American public change their views so dramatically on, on things like gay marriage or the Vietnam War or civil rights or smoking? What happens there? And there's a big, big role for popular culture in this. I mean, things like will and grace had a huge role in changing how the American public looked at gay people because of the way Will was, was portrayed in that show and other shows. So we've been looking at this and trying to see if we could change the way nuclear weapons are portrayed in culture, change them from part of the solution to part of the problem. So for example, you know, nuclear weapons are often seen as our ultimate security, our ultimate protect protector. It's the thing that saves the Earth. Will Smith flies a nuclear bomb up into the belly of the alien mothership in Independence Day. You know, Iron Man flies a nuclear weapon into the transdimensional porthole and kills the alien invasion there. Pacific Rim, et cetera, et cetera. As compared to The Dark Knight Rises, where Batman risks his life to fly a nuclear weapon away from Gotham before it can destroy it. In most of them, they're the hero, they're the solution, but in some of them, they're the problem. So we want to see if we can't work with directors, not to make a movie about nuclear weapons, but just as they use this as a plot element, how do they show it? How do they portray it? And not just in movies, but in, in, in games. Fallout 4, I, I would say, most of you don't know what Fallout 4 is, but a whole bunch of you do and have wasted huge mo moments of your life playing Fallout 4. Depicts nuclear weapons in a very, I would say, realistic way. These are the things that end life on this planet. And that's, we want more of that. Uh, in my book, I say and that nuclear weapons, we believed for decades during the Cold War that nuclear weapons were vital to preserve our security. Uh, the message today, I believe, is that nuclear weapons are a danger to our security. 
Thank you. Um, I agree. I think uh, a lot of it is also looking at the impact. Um, you use a nuclear weapon, no matter where it gets used, it's going to have a negative and a catastrophic impact. Um, because of that catastrophic impact, um, over about a about two-thirds of UN, almost two-thirds of the UN member states are looking at ways to make them illegal and to negotiate a new legal instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. Is this something the United States is going to sign on to? Probably not. Meh. But that external pressure um, from this kind of, this nuclear weapons ban, and a prohibition, a legal instrument prohibiting nuclear weapons is going to help to stigmatize nuclear weapons within the United States, and it's going to help all of our activities. Um, that's because of the impact um, of that these weapons can have. So keep your eyes open on the international space as well, because I'll tell you, a ban is coming. <clears throat> All right. So uh, people talking to people, and there's no such thing as a general public. We have to segment messages and go to the places that Mary and Joe in particular were talking about, in popular culture especially. Two things I'll, I'll mention. Madam Secretary, last Sunday, uh, you know, our sister organization, Bolton Atomic Scientist, they got mention of the doomsday clock on Madam Secretary. I think it's a well-watched TV show. The TV show, I would like to get our message from the scientists and engineers of the world, is Big Bang Theory. I love the Big Bang Theory. And as Max said, I'm a, I'm a geeky guy. And, I, and my wife loves it too, and she was an English major, she's an English, English teacher. She's been saying for years, got to get that to Big Bang Theory. And they've mentioned Oppenheimer and Feynman on Big Bang Theory, but nothing as far as I recall about nuclear weapons and stigmatizing it. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't think there's a large constituency that thinks nuclear weapons are cool. I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem... Let me just clarify. I think there's a large constituency, though, who think that they make us safe. They make us safe, yes. Or that they uh, protect... It and also, it also depends on who us is. Or that we have grievances that can only be worked out. Or we can only protect ourselves through nuclear weapons. And I think... You know, it's it's it. Big Bang Theory won't help uh, uh, with uh, with Vladimir Putin or the Russians. It won't help defuse uh, terrorist use of nuclear weapons. It won't help defuse the Russians possibly feeling threatened and wanting to n have nuclear security, or the Iranians. So I think we have to uh, address grievances and manage grievances as well as not as popular culture. Popular culture is, is wonderful for the United States and I think is important, but I don't think it solves the problem here. Do you want to, it, it's a, obviously a good strategy to try all the, the good ideas people have and see what pans out. So on the, on the particular issue of, of uh, addressing grievances, do you want to give a little more of an explicit example of what, what you have in mind? Well, I think... Managing grievances? Well, you know, I'm a physicist, not a... In, uh, an expert on international relations, but certainly uh, re in recent times, the uh, successful negotiations, negotiations with Iran, I think, were tremendously important and a great achievement. Now, and that was an example. I mean, it's very, it's, uh, it's different cases. Different people have different kinds of grievances. Uh, I also think, oh, one more, I, I wanted to, ha I had another remark here, which is, uh, not only, there's, there are two, there's two approaches to this kind of negative and positive. The, the, neg the negative approach is making the nuclear weapon seem less cool, and that's good. But there's another important aspect, which is to uh, reward uh, positive efforts. And uh, for instance, I think that uh, Stanislav Petrov, who was mentioned here, uh, he should get a Nobel Prize. I mean, he, he was an example of an individual who made a decision that was very important, could be as a model for other people, you know, people who decide, no, I'm not going to do that, could make a big difference. Yeah. Since, you ha since you happen to have one of these little shiny things, do they ask you, the Nobel Committee, only to nominate physics prizes, or can you nominate peace prizes too? Well, I, you wouldn't be allowed to tell us, of course. But well, I don't know if it's. A, I don't think it's a secret. No, I'm, I. I get to nominate in physics and chemistry, but of course I can, without being solicited, just add my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> Any professor can. It depends on your discipline. 
It's a good idea. Uh, Gary. Yeah, I'd like to <clears throat> go back to uh, the question, how do you make it cool for young people to oppose nuclear weapons and nuclear war? Uh, and again, the first step is to educate them about the effects of nuclear weapons and nuclear war. If we could get all the young people to attend these meetings, we'd be in great shape, but of course we don't. Uh, but those of us who teach uh, have opportunities to tell our students about uh, the effects of nuclear weapons and nuclear war, and we can promote groups that are cropping up around the country, like Global Zero and uh, chapters of Peace Action, to uh, form, sponsor them, help them figure out programs that will spread the word. And I think, for some reason that I don't understand, I think we're at a good point right now for generating that kind of interest and enthusiasm for change. Good, I, I think. Just say, Max, yeah, go ahead. I want to say that I want to congratulate you personally on the Future of Life Institute and what it's doing. And I think, you know, trying many different things that you're doing with uh, the, the internet, with meetings like this, uh, is a wonderful thing to do. And we'll see what works. Try them all. <laughs> Thank you for your kind words. Thank you for your support and being part of the F of FLI, of course, as well. Very, very, very grateful for your help, Frank. So on, on this uh, upbeat note that you made there, Gary, I think this is the perfect um, way to segue into um, opening up the questions for all of you. I'm sure there are many. So you can race here, but don't fall. Take it easy to the microphones. And remember, 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 questions, not speeches or, mon or very long statements. Keep the, the briefer you keep them, the more fun questions we will get through. And we'll probably we'll try to do it also so that rather than every person on the panel answering everything, we'll tr try to have it most one or two field them. So uh, you ran very quickly to the mic. You get that. Yes. Ask um, first. Yeah, so I actually have a question for the physics professors in the audience. Um, would you, I mean, for example, there's a lot of physics PhDs who go on to work at nuclear weapons labs or defense contractors. So you as educators, have you thought about stigmatizing these employers or have you ever discouraged your grad students or grad students in your department to not work at these institutions or for these companies? Do you want to comment on that? Uh, well, I've wanted to bring up uh, a point that's related to this and to what I've been saying all along, that physicists in their training tend not to learn much about nuclear weapons. And physicists in their training are freshmen, juniors, seniors, graduate students, and it, in order to address what is a big lack in education that I personally myself had, I, I've related this in the workshop, I was a, a graduate student at the University of Chicago and many of my teachers worked on the Manhattan Project. They never talked about it. We never discussed nuclear fission and it Years later, I wondered what was going on that prevented this from being talked about. Herbert Anderson, uh, Sam Allison, these were people intimately involved in the Manhattan Project. Well, that has to change. And many of us in the physics community think that this should change. And so we're presenting a letter to the American Physical Society asking to recommend that all members of the society that teach physics to undergraduates and graduates will incorporate issues of nuclear weapons and the nuclear arms race uh, in their coursework. It's very easy to go from introducing the notion of energy to nuclear energy to nuclear fission. And so we're <clears throat> going to be circulating these, these letters to our colleagues in the physics community and asking to bring the recommendation to all the members of the society, which is a fairly large group. Great. Frank, do you want to chime in here also since uh, 
who were called out as a physicist. Anybody here who's a member of the APS or a student member of the APS, find Gary afterwards and sign off. Yes, I think uh, deeper involvement with education is very appropriate and important. Uh, in my personal experience, this issue has never really come up. I've had former students go into finance. <laughs> which I'm not sure if that's better or worse than. <laughs> but, uh, but in any way, I, have mixed fe I would have mixed feelings about it because the work is going to be get done, and it's a question of whether it's going to be done well or badly. Uh, I think the real the, the level at which these issues have to be addressed is not so much the technical ish level, uh, but the political level, making choices of what we want to do. Yeah. You, Charles, are also part of the physics mafia. What do you think? A lot of questioners, but I think this is a very important question, and I'll try to be very brief. Um, the thing is, we're going to need talented engineers and scientists still working in the weapons labs. Part of the reason is what Dr. Perry answered to my question, because you know, the reverse the Manhattan Project to dismantle the, the weapons and to safeguard the nuclear materials for decades to come, we'll need talented, technically trained people to do that. And uh, you know, by a time I can tell you my personal history of going to Los Alamos, spending two summers there, and then finally making the decision to leave the, the, the nuclear navy. Uh, you know, save that for some other time. But I've lived through that. I, I was at the end of the Cold War. I'm old enough to experience that. So, but we still need these people going into that field. Great. Yeah, just as a physicist, not not as the chair of the panel, I just want to add to that that um, I agree that <clears throat> we don't. It would be a mistake, of course, for all idealistic people with technical skills to stay away from from where these decisions are made. Uh, on the other hand, I think. It, at the same time, very important that we define the goal of physics and more broadly of science not as just bu building cool whiz-bang things just for the heck of it because we can or because someone pays us for it, but build it because we want to make the world a better place and ask why. And this is something which I, f I think we all feel very com comfortable teaching in class and telling our students about, and it's also something very deeply rooted here, going all the way up to Maria Zuber and to our president, Raphael Reif, who liked to say in, com in commencement speeches that, look, we are about not doing technology. The goal here is not to develop technology, period. The goal here is to develop technology to create a better future. Uh, I add one more thing. That I think it's important for scientists who go into uh, this kind of applied work to maintain scientific standards. This came up very much in, uh, in the Strategic Defense Initiative, for instance, where there was a level of dishonesty and you know, taking the money and running that I think uh, real scientists should not have participated in and should not participate in. And, if, and there's another good example. It's good if you have a scientist there who's good and idealistic, and, and instead of just taking the money and shutting up, they blow the whistle and say, look, this, this is BS. You know, then they've, it was good that they went into it. So we have, uh, that was a question that, was, that spurred a lot of response. Uh, your turn. One of the hope in terms of nuclear has been the growth of the nuclear weapon-free zone all over the world. And uh, um, at the UN, they've been asking more, nations have been asking more and more for a Middle East nuclear free zone. So with uh, Obama working on the iron deal, that could bring us closer to a Middle East uh, weapon of mass destruction free zone. Um, we could see eventually the US as a weapon of mass destruction free zone. That's very idealistic, but it would be nice to see. All right. Uh, I don't think that. I think that was more of a of a, a vision and hope than a, than a question. So let's go on to you. My question, or oh, my question, it? is a slightly different level. I'm with the American Friends Service Committee, and with its tradition of quiet diplomacy, we have a program based in China that does work in North Korea. And, and my my question is either to Mr. Ciceroni or to Secretary Perry. I received an email last night from our staff in China 
uh, asking uh, uh, what, what was the meaning or what came out of Obama's meeting with Prime Minister Abe and, uh, and President Park, maybe with Xi as well, Xi Jinping, in relationship to North Korea's uh, uh, nuclear weapons program. Do you, do you have any information in terms of uh, what came out of those discussions? No. <laughs> But do you want, one of us has actually negotiated with the North Koreans. Do you want to say anything about North Korea and what you might hope? Uh, well, I'll just give you one anecdote from my meeting in Pyongyang about a decade and a half ago. As I arrived here representing President Clinton, I was out of office by now. I was back at Stanford, but he asked me to be his envoy to, to deal with the North Koreans. And I went over and First night I got there, I met with the president of North Korea, who's kind of a functional person, no serious. But he had my agenda, and I looked at it, and I said, there's no military man on this agenda. I want to meet with one of your senior military people. I was Secretary of Defense. I want to talk with your military people. So the next morning, sure enough, I walked into the meeting, and there was a North Korean general standing there. And he came over to me and said, I'm general such and such. He said, this meeting was not my idea. I was told to meet with you. <laughs> he said, I don't think we should be even discussing giving up nuclear weapons. And well, I'd like somebody who puts it on the line like that. And so I said, why do you think you need nuclear weapons? And he said, to protect ourselves. And I said, from whom? And he said, from you. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was a good many years ago. It was, it was the, during the time when the uh, United States and, and NATO were bombing uh, Serbia. And he said, if you send bombs on the Pyongyang, we will retaliate with nuclear weapons on your cities. Pause. Not excluding Palo Alto. <laughs> right hometown. <laughs> the meeting actually went on to be a very good discussion after that. But that, that got it off to a pretty good start, I thought. <laughs> Wonderful. So well, let's see, which side are we on now? You. Oh, so first of all, I believe the uh, woman who just spoke did have a question. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was about was there hope for a m nuclear free zone in the Middle East? Was that your question, Ben? Yes. Oh, if someone, I apologize well, for let misunderstanding me, this. So does well, someone want to chime in on that? Yeah. Dim, dim. Uh, it's it comes up all the time. We've been we've never been close. Uh, the, uh, the uh, I think you're right. The the stopping the Iranian nuclear program, stopping another war in the Middle East was a major, you had to do that in order to have any hope of getting to a Middle East free of nuclear weapons. But there's still such antagonism, such chaos in the region. Egypt, who's been the major sponsor of this, is, 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 is in a very weak position at this point. It's not at the top of their agenda. So no, I wouldn't anticipate any progress on that front at all for the foreseeable future. Anybody disagree with that? Yeah, that uh, Gunther Miller has made this beautiful globe here, which actually shows all the nuclear free zones. Sadly, they look a little bit deflated at the moment. <laughs> Hopefully, we can White turn ribbon that is a nuclear free zone. <laughs> yeah. Well, Go ahead. I think it's very. Uh, on. Yeah, that's one. So, a great question. You have to differentiate between a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East and a weapons of mass destruction free zone. So, you know, if you look at Israeli, right? Okay, yeah. So, uh, why well, I would say, you know, we have some hope with the Iran deal, with nuclear. Syria, Syria is a big freaking mess, and, but with chemical weapons, people criticize President Obama for the stance he took, but I think it was the right move, and we got the Russians to actually cooperate and work with us, and we think we've probably dismantled and destroyed most of those chemical weapons that Assad and Syria had. And so that's progress, and I think that could address part of Israel's concern as well. You know, the big secret in the room. I once gave a talk at an, a, a weapons laboratory. I won't say which one. You can pick which one of the three. And I was told, and I was talking about work I'd done with, with Secretary Perry and General Scowcroft, and they said, Charles, with one request, do not mention that Israel has nuclear weapons. We're not allowed to say that here at this, this, this national laboratory or any of the laboratories. I won't say which laboratory, but it was, yeah. So 
I had a question too. I was just clarifying that um, exactly. the woman who spoke before me had a question. So also, Doctor Who has had a history of making very subtle anti-bomb things. So just uh, endorsement there. Also, they've been putting political agendas into children's minds since 1963. Just saying. Anyway, um, the question I had. So obviously, I'm a young person, but I'm also a creator. I'm a writer. I'm a musician. How does that play in? I know that's kind of a strange question, but to those of you who aren't named Mary, because I talk to you all the time, um, uh, how do I, as a young creator, fit into the story? Um, Frank, I think, was a nanosecond ahead, and then, and then Susie. Well, there are some marvelous examples of uh, creations, artistic creations based that are uh, uh, I think important in 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 uh, in the nuclear weapons uh, culture. <laughs> Thinking about it, uh, of course, uh, Doctor Strangelove. Yeah. Uh, oh well, that that's the first step you should take. <laughs> so if you could do a sequel to Doctor Strangelove or something that could be shown in association with it, that's a great platform. Uh, there are these. There were two television series that I don't remember the name of, but the day after, I think the day after was one that had an, that w was discussed earlier had direct influence on Ronald Reagan. So uh, and then develop some apps, develop some games. There are many, many possibilities <laughs> for. <laughs> well, you have to work with the team, but yeah, uh, there are many possibilities. I think for uh, dramatizing these issues, they are tremendously important human issues. Uh, Secretary Perry showed us a tremendous, tremendously affecting video. Uh, Max Max had also a, 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 an effective. Video, so so there there are lots of opportunities. I think. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say something. Um, earlier today, you told us in, a, in the workshop about a small video that you had made. Then you shared that on Twitter with the MIT nukes hashtag, um, and then I saw that getting retweeted and retweeted and retweeted. Keep making stuff. Okay, so you're making stuff. Keep doing it. You're doing it. Really? Yeah. No, seriously. <laughs> Keep doing it because if, as you do it, the more you do it, you're going to get better at it. People are going to see it. More people are going to be inspired to do it. You are an educator now. Thank you. <laughs> Joe. So when you, so you, no, no, yeah. So you can do stuff like this. You can just throw it out there. But you know, it really helps if you have a hook. If you hook it to something that's already going on. So, for example. Uh, Dr. Perry did a tremendous op-ed uh, about a month ago now calling on President Obama to kill just one weapon system, kill the new cruise missile. It is perhaps the most destabilizing, dangerous weapon in this banquet of nuclear weapons we have coming. This particular one is susceptible, one, to tremendous destabilizing uh, effects if it's actually deployed. Two, if we don't build this, perhaps the United States could take the lead in banning all nuclear cruise, cruise missiles, as Dr. Perry points out. And, and three, we might actually be able to knock this sucker off. We might actually be able to do it. So hook your creativity to this, because when you do something like that, for as an example, when you do something like that, then he sees it, his institute picks it up, the Perry Project picks it up, Global Zero picks it up, I pick it up, and then boom. You know, you're, you're going into something that's already, ha already happening, already moving. Uh, I have one. It is on. Yes. Uh, one uh, remembrance. One of, one of the people who inspired me to be involved in anti-nuclear work was Linus Pauling. And Linus Pauling and his collaborators managed to get the uh, Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty passed. And the way, one of the methods they used was to focus on the radioactive material that was blanketing the Earth because of these tests of larger and larger hydrogen bombs. Strontium-90 is a radioactive element that's related to calcium in the periodic table, and it gets into the bones. And so Pauling and company started a campaign to have mothers and, and dads send their children's baby teeth to a common place. And the baby teeth 
were tested for radioactivity. And it was true. I mean, the Earth is still uh, blanketed with strontium-90, which has a half-life of some 30 years, from those tests. Well, I'm bringing this up because there's great focus now on the Zika virus, which is causing birth defects, uh, and quite dramatic and terrible. Well, radi radiation causes birth defects, and we know about that from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and from the tests that were done in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. And it seems to me that if people become aware of what kind of birth defects have resulted and can result from nuclear weapons, uh, this is one way to get the message across. Thank you so much, guys. Great. So we're, we're getting uh, dangerously close to the witching hour here. I think we're going to go into just a little bit of overtime since there's uh, so many people standing up here. But let's think of this a little bit as speed dating. So very quick questions, very quick answers so we can uh, get everybody a voice here. Yes. So PhD in physics, MIT. Uh, one of the questions that go to the coolness factor addressing that. Uh, so I've been working on the divestment campaign in fossil fuels, and I was wondering if you had been thinking of any real collaborations with the climate movement, because even in this discussion, even our group, once you mention no nuclear weapons, you kind of go into the, like, no nuclear at all, and you kind of, like, lose a lot of people that would support you. And so have you thought of any real collaborations in terms of, like, even public awareness or education? and also just kind of like building allies that way so you could spread the message faster. As the chair of the organizing committee, that was a central, as the chair of the program committee, that was a central theme right from the beginning. Yeah. How could we get some of the students who, and faculty who are mobilized around divesting from fossil fuels, how could we get them to work together and finally decided, well, maybe if we had a conference, a few would come. Because I was, yeah, that's why I was on the panel. But I was kind of wondering for you, at your level, yeah. have you been thinking about well, this? We absolutely have. And please email me. We want to talk to you because if, if anybody who cares about plus two degrees Celsius should also care about minus 20 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Do you want to make a quick uh, comment, Charles? Yeah, I think that the, the natural you know, technical energy source is nuclear energy. I know it's controversial in some people in the environmental movement, but there are noted climate scientists like Jim Hansen who's very pro-nuclear energy. Nuclear energy, you know, can't solve this problem. We need, you know, a lot of silver bullets, so to speak. But I think that could be a bridging uh, issue to, for those two communities. And Alan Robach himself is a bridging a bridge between the two communities. The nuclear winter was brought to our attention by climate scientists. Question. Well, just kindest respects to all the panelists. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Dr. Tegmark, for uh, uh, hosting this discussion. And and yeah, just thank you for hosting this discussion, which is not, um, which is conducive even to uh, passionate disagreement. If you try to go to a Trump rally and do that, you'll just get kicked out. So thank you. Um, just. Wanted to mention that uh, I, I just think that uh, Martin Luther King and Douglas MacArthur really had it right when they said that unless we build a world completely without war and based on peaceful collaboration amongst nations, we will simply go extinct. And I would just say that I think Secretary John Kerry the other day in his comments on his discussion with the American and Russian astronauts and uh, highlights that kind of collaboration which we need to strive for. And I would mention one more thing is that China has offered to collaborate with us on uh, the new Silk Road Economic Development Project to end poverty. And I think that uh, we should take that up. And if anybody on the panel has a, a comment on how we might be able to achieve that kind of collaboration on the U.S. and uh, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, question. Um, I think it was about 15 years ago. Jonathan Shell wrote a very, to me, very interesting essay called "The Gift of Time," that some of us may remember. And one piece came up there which I found conceptually helpful. I'm not a scientist or engineer. He made a distinction 
between what he called vertical and horizontal nuclear disarmament. As I understand it, vertical is simply getting rid of the warheads and the delivery systems. Horizontal is looking at the production process, maybe even the educational process, the sort of pieces that fit together which ultimately produce the actual weapons themselves. And my sense is that the Iran agreement actually tried to do this kind of horizontal dis disarmament. I'm not sure if that's correct. But it also strikes me, and I may well be wrong here, it strikes me that perhaps if you work at the horizontal level, then you run into less major political obstacles. It's perhaps somewhat more kind of technocratic, if you will. Anyway, I don't know if this is fruitful and if anybody wants to comment on that as a possible approach. Just real quick, while you're thinking of your answer. Uh, you know, I think w one of the reasons we all, so many of us liked the Prague speech and the president's um, uh, policy was he got it right. It was, it was an integrated um, uh, approach. You had to do three things. You have to stop terrorists from getting, their weapon, from getting their hands on the material, stop nuclear terrorism. You had to stop new countries from getting these weapons, and you had to reduce the existing arsenals. And you have to do all of these things, and you have to do them all at once, because progress on one feeds progress on the other, and setbacks on one sets you back on the other. The, the vision was absolutely c correct. The analysis was correct. He made tr advances. Uh, on two of them, particularly with the Iran deal, and he just couldn't quite get the third, and the, th the thing has faltered. It's, so it's, it's incomplete, but, the, but the, the, the project is still there, waiting to be renewed. I associate myself with what Joey just said. <laughs> <laughs> I associate myself with these remarks. All right. The Hi, um, I'm a concerned international relations student at Tufts. Um, my question is about uh, deterrence and like strategic deterrence, and maybe more towards Dr. Percy. Um, I'm, we're taught that an important element of deterrence is the credibility of the threat. So um, persuading the actor, maybe Russia, that um, we are actually willing to to exert the the threat and and to keep keep Russia or whatever actor persuaded that um, there's that the willingness to use this threat is real, and so I was kind of wondering like, what like um, what what's the effect of this kind of limitation on, on what we can do if, if 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 it's if it's important or if it's taught that it's important that we keep the perception of this threat real, um, and maybe how we can get around this limitation. I don't know. Anyone want to feel that? And it, it, this relates to a question about Russia, which has come back many, many times. And maybe just let me just twi twist the question a little bit and see if someone wants to chime in. Uh, we were originally told that we needed all these nuclear weapons to prevent the global spread of communism. Now we're told that we still need them, and and somehow the current arms race feels much less like uh, this ideological battle, communism or, or capitalism, and it feels much more somehow like they run up to World War I, where nobody could really point to exactly what it was that was the ideological difference. This but uh, nonetheless, they hated each other's guts, and, and, and then everybody thought the war wouldn't really break out, and a bunch of weird coincidences took place. Gavrilo Princip decided to assassinate Archduke Ferdinand in Belgrade, and then poof, uh, five years later, everybody was like, hmm, what were we thinking? Uh, uh, so could, if someone wanted to t t just talk a little bit more about uh, the whole Russia situation, if, what you see, if you feel that there is something really fundamental driving it, like there was in the, in, in the communism days, or, or if not, what is it that's, that's so that's driving this, that's so unsupposed yeah, to be yeah, so unsolvable? Think, yeah, I think, Max, you are clarifying it. And it's, it's a good question. And I would say two things. One is that I think Dr. Perry is absolutely right, that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons going, you know, hopefully near, very near term is that just to deter use of other nuclear weapons, period. And that's challenging enough to get that policy forward. And, and you know, I think Joe Srincioni, gave an excellent speech about all the challenges we had in the Obama administration, the resistance internally in the administration. But and maybe she's getting at Ukraine. You know, should the United States and NATO said, look, you know, don't, don't you know, encroach on Ukraine, Vladimir Putin and Russia, because, but it gets to core strategic national interest. 
you get in that slippery slope, and and uh, you know those are core Russian interests as well. And so you know I don't think we should be making nuclear threats idly. And I think this gets back to sole purpose underscore should just be deterring other nuclear weapons. Uh, just to provoke you a little bit more, I mean, if clearly if if you, the sole goal of having nuclear weapons is deterrence, then one could adopt a strategy like what China has now, the uncertain retaliation thing. They have about 200 nukes, but they are really big, the Fendongs. <laughs> and uh, they are not on hair trigger alert, but they're moving around. You know, we figure if we do a first strike, we're probably going to lose at least 50 of our biggest cities. We don't want to do that, and it's enough. <laughs> um, so neither the, not, neither the Russian nor the American nuclear arsenal looks anything like the Chinese. So you can't really explain it as being only about deterrence. So, so, yeah. yeah. Well, about, about 100 fewer, right? yes. So what well, is it about? Maybe this then? is a very good yeah. candidate for our question, whether the candidates would be willing to commit to no first use of nuclear weapons or to a long-term strategy where it would be, yeah. Yeah. It would be clear that the uh, bright red line, which has really been the saving grace of the whole nuclear situation, that they don't get used, period, uh, that, that, that that be maintained, that our policy be based on that perception. Joe? This is real quick, and I won't elaborate, but it's different now than it was 30 years ago or even, e even 10 years ago. I don't believe ideology plays the dominant driver here. I don't believe that differences over the nature of deterrence play the dominant driver, although they're, they're present. Uh, I, I believe politics are a big part of this. I, I'm, if we had had a Republican president who had been proposing the things that Obama proposed, they would have already named an airport after him. We, we, we would, it would have been, the start would have been done. Our, the our deal with Iran would have been done. You know, wouldn't have been this big fight. The politicalization, but, but the main driver is right now, I believe, the, the nuclear industrial complex, not the military industrial complex. There's lots of people doing military. I just mean those people with a vested interest in the contracts and positions and billets that come from this complex. So one of the obstacles to the new START treaty wasn't the negotiations with the Russians, it was the negotiations with the ICBM caucus in the White House, in the, in the Congress. Democrats and Republicans who went to the president and said, you can't go lower in those negotiations because you'll be cutting into the ICBMs. You cannot cut into the ICBMs. Why? Because of deterrence? Because of ideology? Because of physics? No, because they got 2,000 jobs in Montana, period. That's it. You know, so we got to find ways to go and to attack that to convince the business and political leaders of these ICBM states that it's in their vested interest to cash in this chip of declining value for something else, a new mission, a new revenue stream. And if we can do that, if you convince them that Montana should no longer be welcome to Montana, America's nuclear sponge, <laughs> you know, where our mission is to absorb warheads. If we can convince them of that, we can break the back of this thing. <laughs> All right. Um, a lot of very creative ideas here. We do uh, want to uh, honor our promise to let you out here. This is not some sort of MIT detention where you have to stay after hours. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to do is I think we're going to take, who, who's next of the two of you? We'll give. One question, one more question to each side, and then the panelists may, if you smile at them nicely, choose to sit here and answer a few more questions afterwards, informally. Okay. That's in the meantime. There will be book signings. We can do parallel processing. This is MIT. So, so um, you, well, you, you were first, right? No, you were first. Hi, right. uh, I'm a confused graduate student and here then we're gonna in uh, stop, physics, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was wondering about, so in the public discourse, uh, having nuclear we weapons is a deterrent. Um, however, I saw when Max showed the, the map of all the US targets uh, from like 50 years ago, all of Russia, Eastern Europe had a dot. And if you look at the map that the Russia probably has, then we all are covered in dots. Whereas, interestingly enough, none of the nuclear free zones, none of the white regions behind you had any dots on them. So my, my question to, to you guys is, is it is it a better deterrent to have nuclear weapons or to not have nuclear weapons? Uh, 
So you're, you're saying... Um, <laughs> I, that is the conclusion that, that most of the states who have signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty have come to. That they're better off if they don't have nuclear weapons and all their neighbors have nuclear weapons. I thought this point you, you, you made, uh, Eileen, that the entire southern hemisphere is nuclear-free is, re, is, is remarkable. And you know, the people, nobody made Africa have a nuclear-free zone. Nobody made South America have a nuclear-free zone. They decided this is where their security lay. And, and, and I think that's the right calculation. Great. And uh, last but not least. <laughs> um, my name is Tristina. I'm a freshman here at MIT, and I would like to thank all the panelists for being here today. Uh, um, my question is about education. So um, as I see it, education in about nuclear weapons is twofold. Uh, one would like to educate both everyone about the dangers of nuclear weapons, as well as to educate all the people who would like to learn how they actually work. And so potentially they can go to doing STEM fields and so on and so forth. But how does one accomplish this? Does one have to look at this and say, it's a two-fold mission, or can one do both at the same time? And then what's the time frame for doing this education? Who wants to feel this? <laughs> OK. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, I think, as I've said, the education about nuclear weapons can begin with freshman physics and, <clears throat> and first-year engineering courses uh, because it, it's a natural subject to address at that point. Uh, the question I think you're asking is how much do you want to learn about it and, and what do you want to do with that knowledge? Uh, you can learn more and more about nuclear weapons once you get the basics. Uh, I don't know if there are courses that particularly address that, but certainly in our modern physics courses and advanced nuclear physics courses, you can learn about fission and fusion. Uh, and you can learn enough, I think, by reading some good textbooks on the subject to uh, understand why the Iranian deal went the way it did and what it has to do with centrifuges and, and why uh, certain kinds of reactors produce more uh, plutonium than others and so on. Those are things that your nuclear engineering classes here can teach you and do, I think. Great. And uh, we shouldn't limit ourselves to universities. My 16-year-old my son, Philip, who has patiently been waiting for his daddy here, saying, why aren't you coming? Uh, you know, he, I, he t I asked him the other day how, m how much he's learned about nuclear weapons in his, in his entire trajectory through the US school system. <laughs> Nothing so far. <laughs> and, and I think we're going to give the very, very last word to you. Well, in answer to that last question, uh, my course at Stanford he devotes three very intense hours to nuclear weapons. What they are, how they're used, what the consequences are. Um, that's about a few hundred Stanford students a year get that information. I, as I told you, I'm converting that into a MOOC, and so that course will be available on the internet, I hope, by the end of the year. So if you want to, in three, if you're willing to devote three hours to learn about nuclear weapons, get on my MOOC. All right. I want to end uh, the, the day here by, uh, first of all, giving a round of thanks. Thank you so much to the wonderful panelists here. Let's give it up for them. A big round of thanks also to all of the speakers we've heard throughout the day here. I've never felt as optimistic, actually, about this situation because there have been so many cool ideas. Thank you, everybody.